Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's actually now a very tough act to follow after Barack uh, and after such a kind introduction. I, first of all, it's great to be back here. Thanks to the organizers, to Efraim and his staff, and uh, to uh, Neighbourhood for supporting this uh, important event. When I, when I say important, my main point is that over the past three years, I think the Eastern Mediterranean has become the most important geostrategic region for French uh, interests, for a variety of reasons. They, for, for a variety of reasons. There is no other region in the world currently today which is as important for us as the Eastern Med. We have six key interests in the Eastern Med. I'm going to give them without hierarchization. It's two group two groups of three interests. One is obviously containing jihadi terrorism. By the way, an anecdote after November the 13th, uh, this country, Israel, I'm told, was very forthcoming in proposing uh, assistance, and we're grateful for that. ISIS includes about 2,000 to 3,000 uh, French nationals, about 20 of them being converts, interestingly. So our homeland security now is, for obvious reasons, uh, very much looking at the Eastern uh, Med. The second key interest is containing the financial crisis, which, believe me, is far from being over. And given that the epicenter of the financial crisis was Greece, given also that uh, some countries in the Mediterranean Basin uh, are remain extremely fragile from a budgetary and financial point of view. That is also a key reason of our focus on the uh, Eastern Med. The third interest is containing migrations. Now, uh, my country happens not to be one of the favorite uh, destinations of uh, migrants for a variety of reasons. Germany and the UK are actually uh, deemed more attractive. But the political dimension, the psychological resonance of the migration is issue is huge in France and will continue to be, um, you know, as you know, they, we don't have a map here, but you know, the uh, Med route and the Balkans route all both come obviously from uh, across the uh, uh, Eastern Mediterranean. The migrants issue is actually connected to two other security issues. One is ISIS, the other is Russia. Why? It's because, interestingly, ISIS and Russia have contradictory interests vis-a-vis -vis migrations in Europe. Russia is actually quite happy with our massive migration flows. Russia is interested in, the, in having the migrant issue destabilizing European politics. ISIS has a very different interest. For ISIS, migration is a failure because it means that the attractiveness of the Islamic State is not as important, as, as significant as they claim it to be. Nevertheless, uh, reinforcing Frontex, something that uh, uh, one of my colleagues mentioned, is of extreme importance today for us because reinforcing Frontex is about saving Schengen. Schengen being one of the pillars of the EU. So whatever our, the stance that our respective countries take on migration, we do have today a common interest in the EU of saving Frontex, because saving Frontex is, well, reinforcing Frontex, because saving Frontex is about um, saving one of the key, uh, a key, as we say uh, in English, uh, of the European construction, that is the free movement of uh, goods and people in the Schengen area. Now, taken together, these three interests, these three issues, will, I will submit to you, will determine the future of the European Union. Terrorism, the financial crisis, migrations, and their various interconnections, that will determine the, f the future of the Union in the next five years. Now, we have three other, no less important, strategic interests in the Eastern Med. Uh, one is obviously the security of Israel, another is the stability of Lebanon, 
And finally, there is also the so-called uh, peace process. Let me now focus briefly on six different countries and try to explain what I believe French policy is vis-à-vis -vis these uh, six countries. Let me start with Libya because it's, uh, it's in the news, as many other countries in the Med. Um, let me say it up front. I think France made the same mistake in Libya in 2011 as George Bush did in Iraq in 2003. If you invade a country, if you topple a regime, you have to be ready for uh, a long investment afterwards and a very careful attention given to what happens next. Uh, we had given much less attention to what would happen if Gaddafi disappeared than the Americans had given to what would happen in Iraq if Saddam Hussein was to disappear. So as much as I supported the uh, uh, intervention in Libya in 2011, I think we failed collectively, Europeans, Americans, French, British, Americans, and all of our allies who intervened in Libya. Don't tell me we broke Libya, though. We, Libya was broken in mid-March 2011. Libya was not, you know, it was already a Humpty Dumpty situation. The Western intervention did not break Libya. Libya, as we had known it, Gaddafi's Libya, was already gone. But I think that we are still, all of us, collectively paying the price for a lack of attention after uh, 2011 to, uh, to Libya. Now, the French have uh, said repeatedly over and over over the past three years that there would be a need for a military intervention in Libya to contain the growth of terrorism. They've said it before ISIS took a strong foothold in uh, Sirte. And obviously, uh, this is uh, one of the uh, issues being discussed now among Western capitals. What form, what shape should the next intervention in Libya take? And there will be one. It's not imminent. And believe me, uh, I spoke actually very recently with a a very senior French military official who told me, look, if I, my political authorities tell me to do Libya now, you know, there's, he gave me the number of assets that he could actually assign to that operation. That number was a ridiculously low number. So we are so overstretched by our military operations uh, in the Sahara region, uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere that we cannot as French, we cannot now embark in a major operation in Libya. But then again, are we going to let ISIS expand its territory around Sirte? Are we going to let it embark in uh, oil trafficking uh, to generate new revenues? That's a common challenge. And that's not a challenge for France. That's not a challenge for Europe. That's a challenge for the whole international community. And we have now a legitimate government in a, a, a unified government, at least on paper, in Libya. That was the condition that the French had put to uh, supporting a military intervention in Libya. So we have a necessary condition which has been fulfilled. I don't think it's a sufficient condition, so don't expect that intervention to happen very soon. But make no mistake, there will be another military intervention in uh, Libya. Egypt. I think it's fair to say that from the French point of view, although my political authorities would probably not admit it up front, that um, democracy has taken a backseat to stability in terms of what our uh, preferences uh, are today. Uh, for better or worse, uh, we've become very good friends and allies with uh, Marshal Sisi's regime. Uh, one of the reasons is that actually he's a pretty good customer. He's buying and buying and buying and buying. I want a frigate. Okay, I want it frigate now. Yeah, okay, you'll have it. I want profile. Oh, wow. You'll have them. But how are you going to pay? Hey, easy. You know, Saudi money. So Egypt has become, you know, important for reasons which are clearly uh, connected with stability, a very cynical view, some would say an Israeli view, you know, we think the same way, you know. We feel very Israelis now, and after November the 13th, we were all Israelis. And now, uh, with our preference for stability in Egypt over democracy, maybe we'll, we feel also all Israelis. Anyway, so, 
clearly uh, business interests in uh, Egypt are very important these days for us. Lebanon, as you know, we have always cared about the stability of Lebanon for historical, political, sometimes also religious uh, reasons. Uh, and I think it was not only for purely mercantilist reasons that we embarked in a massive deal with Saudi money once again to re-equip and train the Lebanese army. Uh, we believe, rightly or wrongly, that uh, increasing the strengths and solidity and equipment of the Lebanese army is part of the tools, is one, one of the tools that uh, could ensure, could safeguard the integrity and safety of, uh, of Lebanon as a, a state. Once again, this is a complex scheme through which the Saudis finance French defense equipment, which is now so, then sold to, uh, uh, to Lebanon. Um, Israel, now my list is obviously geographic also. Again, it's not a hierarchization. Uh, Israel, I, uh, I was recently digging into some historical material on our relation with Israel, and I, interestingly, I've found a lot of more continuity than a lot of people believe. For instance, with the exception of one president, uh, all of our presidents have made, at one time or another, a commitment to the security of Israel. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that the relation was always very, uh, very good. That includes the goal, by the way, because nobody, you know, you, people always focus to the most uh, famous quotes of the goal, but there were other, there were other important statements by, uh, by the goal. No, the one who did not do it was, uh, was Giscard, actually. So. Um, let me just say a couple of words on the so-called French initiative. I don't know if it's the right word. Um, I think that there was a question of legacy for our uh, Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius. There was his initiative more than the President's initiative. Uh, I do think there's a lot of sincerity in the French uh, démarche. Uh, they don't expect they don't have high expectations, but uh, whether or not it's, it's the appropriate moment, and I don't think it is, whether or not it's the appropriate moment to do another international push for peace, quote unquote, um, I think that now that the French have announced it, they're going to carry it as far as they can. I'm not entirely certain of the exact amount of personal presidential support for that initiative, but at least uh, at the ministerial level, the commitment is uh, very strong. And by the way, the French know that the so-called recognition of Palestine is a one-shot issue. So I think that when they, quote, play a toy with that uh, threat, if it's a threat or a promise, if it's a promise, uh, they know that they only have one shot. And that, I believe, is not a gun that they will fire uh, easily. But that's, hey, that's just my personal assessment. Turkey, um, let me be uh, as blunt as my Turkish friend. Uh, we have, France has, I believe, four problems with the Turkish government today. One is that it has been and continues to successfully blackmailing the European Union in reference to the migration question. And I can't help but saying that there's a certain amount of naiveness of Brussels, Brussels, not necessarily capitals, but Brussels, uh, in their dealings with Ankara on this uh, matter. Second problem is that, as is well known, Ankara is deliberately striking in uh, Syria, one of the, non, one of the only non-Islamist forces on the ground, thereby contributing to the slow disappearance of non-Islamist forces in Syria, a tragedy that I think will one day come back to haunt us all, Israelis, French and all, but the time is passed for regrets. Uh, the third problem is that there is significant evidence of funding of Turkish origin. I'm not claiming that is government or non-government. I don't 
I don't know. But significant evidence of uh, Turkish funding for Al Nusra, along with Saudi funding. And the fourth problem was brilliantly uh, expounded by my Turkish colleague is that uh, Tur Turkey Ankara Erdogan is falling over and over and over into the traps that Vladimir Putin is opening for him. And that's a problem for us French because Turkey is an ally. Now, don't get me wrong, being an ally, being associated with Turkey in an alliance through Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which commits us, along with all of our other NATO allies, to the defense of Turkey, does not mean, and I hope Turkey realizes that, does not mean that we would support uh, Turkey in every possible way if escalation with Russia stems from Turkish provocations. I think that, I hope that that message has been conveyed clearly by NATO uh, allies. That's not saying we don't have, we do have a commitment and we will respect it. If Russia was to attack Turkey, we would defend Turkey. Let's be very clear about it. But Mr. Erdogan should not assume that NATO will automatically come to the support of its forces if the crisis is own, of his own uh, making. So that's the four problems with, we're having with Turkey right now. Let me conclude with uh, Syria, obviously. In August 2015, way before the November attacks in Paris, in August 2015, uh, Paris changes, altered its position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, intervention, military intervention, military strikes on Syrian territory. Up until then, Paris was operating only in Iraq for a variety of legal and strategic reasons. The choice made in August, again, before Paris and before the Russian intervention, the choice made in August was to expand, with our limited means, was to expand our operations not, not only in Iraq, but now also in Syria. And these operations were obviously intensified after the uh, November uh, attack. But the problem is that you know, France is a, a significant military power, but uh, we are so overstretched that we cannot uh, intensify very much our operations in Syria, especially since our intelligence assets are also limited. But um, I would say that uh, the feeling that prevails today in Paris about Syria is something which is very well known in this country, and that's something we've heard already since yesterday night, is our frustration vis-a-vis -vis Washington. There is a lot of frustration vis-a-vis -vis Washington today uh, on, it, on the US Syria policy. This frustration operates at two different levels. One is military, the second is political. Militarily, um, it's no secret that the French would, be, would want Washington to focus a little more on Syria, whereas the main military focus of the US is on Iraq. And politically, uh, I sense frustration because of the way the US State Department is currently negotiating with Russia on the future of Syria. And the noise that I hear reminds me of something, uh, reminds me very clearly of something. The, what I hear about the US State Department behavior in negotiating on Syria with Russia reminds me exactly the way the US State Department was negotiating with Iran two years ago. In other words, it seems to me that, you know, I respect John Kerry for his energy, but frankly, I sometimes think that he's more interested in satisfying his adversaries than in uh, satisfying his uh, friends and allies. So that frustration that I can feel in Paris about the US in Syria is something uh, which uh, is becoming uh, problematic. So that's it for this tour d'horizon of the Eastern Med. 
Again, I would submit to you that it has become, over the past three years, the most important geostrategic uh, region for French interests. It will certainly, almost certainly remain so over the, over the next three years. And I believe that in this context, it's very important to have strong and good uh, French-Israeli bilateral ties and French-Israeli cooperation. I just hope, and that's a personal note, that our uh, diplomatic initiatives will not uh, create uh, uh, too much trouble on that and that we will be able to insulate our cooperation from uh, these uh, grand uh, diplomatic uh, uh, initiatives. Thank you very much.